I will uh, talk today about uh, the cloud run monolith, the dialectical synthesis. <laughs> okay, so there are different software architectures in the web world. Okay, you have monoliths. Those were fairly popular, uh, fairly popular in the PHP and Java backend days. You know, you had uh, one uh, big application which was responsible for rendering for the backend, etc. Uh, and now microservices are very popular in uh, which several small services just uh, uh, are being called by JavaScript frontends and uh, just uh, communicate with JSON. Okay, so Monolith. Uh, contains front-end as well as back-end code. And uh, it was always considered good practice to clearly separate back-end and front-end logic, uh, as people didn't want uh, a lot of PHP logic inside their templates, mostly. They just want, uh, wanted PHP to render them, but uh, uh, nothing uh, fancy there. <laughs> but the application was also runs, uh, responsible for rendering the templates themselves. Uh, and uh, those design uh, patterns are reflected in the popular frameworks at the time. Uh, Symfony uh, for PHP, Django for Python. Uh, those application frameworks were also responsible for the backend and for rendering the front end as well. Okay, but microservices are on the rise. Um, here is a clearer separation between front end and back end. Those are separate projects. And I think it has to do with the rise of JSON and JavaScript frameworks as well, which make just fetching JSONs and like very easy and uh, rendering them uh, instantly into fancy uh, <laughs> JavaScript and HTML stuff. And uh, it's also useful for larger companies as they can divide teams to work on specific tasks. For instance, uh, I could assign Matthijs to the, I don't know, uh, the taxi service uh, or the user service or whatever, <laughs> and someone else on some other service. So you kind, uh, kind of can divide the different tasks between different teams. Uh, so uh, teams can get specialized into one service. Uh, and uh, nowadays, containers allow for specific configurations to be easily deployed. Like an uh, autonomous team can implement an, uh, an API in any way they want, as long as they follow uh, a certain specification. But it doesn't always suit uh, people, and especially not us, I think, since we are a small team. So dividing up all the work into separate services doesn't make a lot of sense uh, for me. And there's also overhead in maintaining all those separate services, especially when they have to communicate uh, with each other, getting them in sync. Uh, we all uh, already have a lot of work into getting Terminus B server and the uh, hot backend uh, in sync. So uh, imagine it's all being split up into different services and the like, and having to uh, commit in a separate repo, then commit in the other, etc., and getting them all in sync. Uh, it just gets uh, very complex. Uh, so the architecture uh, gets more complex. And uh, I also think faster iteration is therefore possible on the monolith uh, since you can, uh, you can just change uh, a lot of things in one go instead of having to maintain all those separate services and uh, getting them uh, communicate with each other uh, the exact way you want. And I also have some other criticisms uh, of the microservice architecture. I think it's uh, also de-skilling web developers. Like in earlier times, people uh, had to know sysadmin stuff, like basic Apache stuff, um, as well as backend and frontend stuff. Uh, and it also uh, needs additional configuration. Like it can get uh, complex to uh, have all those APIs talk to each other. That's why you also need API gateways and the like uh, to make it uh, <laughs> easier to configure them. So the configuration can, uh, can get very complex uh, as well. Uh, there are also different deployment strategies now, like uh, very popular in the past were uh, VMs that ran these monoliths. Uh, you had one Symfony application or one big uh, Java <laughs> Tomcat server or the like, and it just ran the application. But nowadays, uh, since microservices are more of a thing, uh, those mostly run on Kubernetes clusters. But there's also a deployment strategy that's getting more popular as well, and that is uh, functions as a service. And I will dive deeper into that specifically. Um, yeah, functions as a service. You have uh, AWS Lambda, they're from Amazon, Google Cloud Functions, etc. And the server uh, behind this is only uh, up when it actually needs to run. And you only pay 
for what you actually use. So there's not a server running in the background continuously, or maybe they are in secret in Google's, uh, <laughs> Google's uh, data centers and the like, but uh, you don't pay for them. Uh, the downside of this is that you have slower startup times um, because the environment needs to spin up and then uh, it runs. But those can be mediated by caching and the like. So I don't think that is a huge issue. And uh, those often have platform-specific frameworks, like Amazon has their own APIs, Google, Cloudflare workers, um, and also different deployment strategies. So that means that sometimes you can get vendor locked. Of course, most of these functions as a service uh, run Python and JavaScript, and that's very portable. But they still have their specific deployment stuff, uh, their specific APIs which you can use, etc. So that's a big disadvantage, even though I do think that it's a cool uh, deployment strategy uh, and a cheap one if you only pay for what you actually use. But Google launched a new service, which is called Cloud Run. And it basically works like functions as a service, but it uh, allows you to just drop a Docker image and run it in a serverless way. So as long as you have a stateless Docker image, then it just magically works and scales and <laughs> does everything you want as a, as a function, as a service. And it prevents vendor locking this way, as you could just run the uh, container on a VM as well, or on a Kubernetes cluster. So you're not stuck with Google Cloud Run forever if you choose to, uh, to use it. It doesn't have any specific APIs and the like. And basically anything that supports Docker uh, is okay. And TerminusDB.com is now hosted on Cloud Run. And um, I think uh, the experience so far is pretty good. You know. Uh, we currently have the Hub API on uh, TerminusDB.com, um, as well as the front end. So the TerminusDB.com static site is currently hosted on uh, the CloudRun, but the Hub API is as well. And uh, in that way, we can uh, make a tighter integration between those services uh, without having to maintain uh, 10 different repos uh, with different APIs. <laughs> Um, it's just one application, one repo, and one container. And it's a simple Node.js Express uh, application. And so far, we have uh, more than a month of hosting. Uh, and it's just 50 cents <laughs> so far. Wow. So it's been uh, pretty cheap as well. And I do think that this is a kind of dialectical synthesis between the old monolith uh, style and the new deployment strategies with uh, functions as a service. Uh, and I think we are uh, like, I haven't come across across this uh, strategy uh, on the internet. Uh, it's, it's something we thought up. So I thought it would be a good subject for my all hands since uh, I think it's fairly, uh, fairly new. Maybe some companies do this already, but uh, I haven't found any of them yet. So uh, if people are watching this on YouTube, uh, please comment if you do. <laughs> so we can share some uh, experience. And you work. heard it here first. Yeah, <laughs> you heard it here first. You DevOps guru. Yeah. School coming out, people. Yeah. <laughs> you just need a, a coin, a catchy name for it, and then yeah. uh, we're good. Yeah, yeah I uh, I think Dimitri thought of a name. Uh, well, I mean, the uh, it reminds me a lot of the uh, of the Heroku Twelve Factor app, right? It's uh, it's kind of it's kind of the same the same idea in that uh, in that. You could easily replicate a monolith so long as so long as uh, storage is attached. So long as storage is not something that is uh, given. But it's even better because of the function as a service angle. So like uh, in in with the twelve factor app on Heroku, uh, you're still replicating individual VMs, right? That Heroku called Dynos. Uh, whereas there, whereas there in this case, it's really kind of just like making a bunch of like function as a service. Um, uh, thing. So it's like you're just kind of packaging your all of your functions as service functions together in a container, and then and then it's being um, hosted by the distributed cloud run kind of infrastructure. So it, 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 it I think it's an evolution of the twelve factor app, but the twelve factors in the twelve factor app would still need to be uh, uh, more or less followed, right? So code base dependencies, config. Uh, the backing services, the build release run, all the all the things in the twelve factor app are exactly the same, exactly the same thing. So it's kind of like a, a you know decentralized monolith, and it will still have it will still break down. Eventually, this is going to be a problem, but only when um, we want to assign responsibility for different areas to different teams. Only then 
will will it start to become will it start to become an issue because of because of release schedules and all that kind of stuff and mm. then and then we have known patterns to deal with this right then we can build stranglers we can build facades um, there's uh, there's known there's there's known patterns to how you take a monolith and break it down right we uh, uh, um, but uh, so that's uh, so that's not a problem. So it's much better to just intentionally make you know this kind of distributed monolith, this kind of serverless monolith, um, and then uh, and then iterate fast, as Robin says. And then one once uh, once your team grows, that you want to you know give responsibility of different parts of the system to different teams and give them full autonomy. Then you break down your monolith using known patterns like the strangler pattern. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even then, you can still assign specific res responsibilities for one application. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's basically it. So, uh, any questions or discussion points? Or, uh, by the way, something about descaling. Um, it's kind of a trade-off. On the one hand, I think specialization is also good. You know, uh, that you don't have to care about sysadmin stuff when you are a web developer. Mm -hmm. But on the other ha other hand, I kind of feel like some knowledge is lost there as well. Uh, yeah, so I do think that's kind of a, a trade-off between. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm a huge fan of de-skilling myself. I like knowing as little <laughs> as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like the scaling of this stuff as well to a certain extent, but I hear what you're saying, Robin. Like, yeah. it definitely is. I mean, yeah. web devs nowadays, the difference between their kind of mental model of how their stuff is deployed and how it's actually deployed could be anything. You know what I mean? It's it's like the world that they're working in or the worlds that their deployment is is different worlds that they may not have any idea what's going on. You know. <clears throat> so one other thing is, I guess the when you have a bundle of different uh, connected like ways of connecting, like a bundle of APIs, that's that's um, that's like the agent model. So the agent model was a thing where it didn't just have, it wasn't just a function, it had like di different entry points. It's like an object that just talks to you. So it's like a stateless object. So in some ways it might be like agents as a service or something, I don't know. <laughs> oh. Well, on the back end, I mean, this is all K-native running on Kubernetes. So on the back end, it has a lot of aspects of that old kind of like uh, actor agent kind of airline kind of, you know, like lots of different pieces moving together yeah. um, model. But and definitely point, like, guys, the way you set up the hub API stuff, uh, the, the hub services and stuff uh, was incredibly convenient and surprising so because it's a hard thing to talk to because you have to have it up on the internet and so on. But actually between the hub API and, and Hub itself, that was incredibly smooth, you know, which is probably a consequence of the, this architecture, but it made a huge difference compared to the other parts when every pixel or every um, electron coming out of the JWT into that part was, was blood, sweat and tears, whereas as soon yeah. as it got in there, it was, it was fine. We could see everything. <laughs> so. So I appreciate it, or I strongly appreciate the effort and thought you put into it. It, it makes a big difference, you know. So there are a bunch of organizations that still argue for monoliths um, and believe that monoliths kind of are still the way to go. Like the one that I see most of is um, your man, the Ruby on Rails guys at Basecamp. 37 yeah. signals. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think Love GitHub that. still runs uh, Ruby on Rails monoliths. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. So, so, so wh why, wh why is he so, like, I mean, I, I see the arguments there, but he, he in their big organization, obviously have specialized teams that are doing their own delivery cycles in one way or the other. Um, and how are they approaching the monolith to uh, kind of um, deliver that agile-ish work practices with a monolith? So um, it doesn't really, uh, like it really, it really, you know, it's just a way to divide up teams, right? And you can divide up teams in different ways. Like that, you can divide up teams on the application surface, or you can divide up teams along the application layers, right? So you could have like, uh, like a team that works on front end, a team that works on storage, a team that mm -hmm. works on like, and so I think that's what they're 
more doing. Mm-hmm. I bet the number of people that are actually working on the on the front end of Git, the Git UI, where the which is the, the monolith part, is probably not as big as you know all of GitHub itself, because a lot of their problems are the storage engineering, and that's obviously not a monolith. It's not just one big computer somewhere that's storing all of the repos for the world, right? <laughs> so, so obviously that's distributed computing of some kind. Uh, you know, whether it's just whether they're just using S3 or whether they have their own stuff built, or probably some hybrid. Um, uh, and so I think that's like you can divide things up in several ways, right? So it's really totally. like that, and that's and that's what I think a lot of a lot of organizations get confused about with microservices, is that uh, is that you know your microservices isn't something that um, solves any problems; it just creates problems, right? It creates redundancy, it creates complexity, right? So it's a solution to a problem. And the problem that it's a solution to is teams unable to release at the same time, stepping each other's toes. Yeah. Uh, like, and and if you don't have that problem, then you don't need that medicine. Mm. Right? And that's right. Uh, right? And that's wow. uh, and that's and yeah. That, and that, it kind of it seemed to become a one size fits all a little bit. Right. Microsoft. Well, well when you've got lots of people, I mean, and the I mean the big problem or why it makes things more complex is you don't really have that top down design of these, you know. So you need testing instead of design. If you're the architect of a, such a system, you know you can't like people are going to be sending off events all over the place, and you can't kind of say, "Oh, here's the architecture of the thing." You've kind of got to go. I'm just going to put a fuck off test in there to make <laughs> steps out of bounds. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I mean, I mean the the you know like um, so a lot of this a lot a lot of this. Uh, uh, comes from around the period when I was at SoundCloud, right? Because we, we, we pioneered a lot of the stuff, but the whole, the whole strangler pattern is actually named after what we did there, named coined by St- Sam Neumann, but uh, by observing what we did at, uh, at SoundCloud. And we had a Ruby on Rails app. So the, the original monolith that we broke down was, uh, was our Ruby on Rails app that we, that we called our mother ship. And we wanted to move towards, you know, what was then called a Twitter style UI, which is just kind of using the, um, you know, like like the single page app kind of approach where like you don't pre-render the things on the server, but you have, uh, you know, so that was one of our main motivations was to support mobile and to, and, to, and to replace our old school Ruby on Rails UI with a Twitter style UI that works primarily in the browser, right? So uh, with client side dynamics. Um, and, so, and so what we did was we created BFFs, which is uh, another term coined from that period that stood, to the, that stood between the monolith and these particular things, and we broke down, and we and we and we and we broke it down so that these things didn't talk directly to the monolith. So that so the so the people working on the mobile web stuff, on the web stuff, on the actual mobile apps, the iOS app, had their own backends that the, that that itself talked to the monolith, and then eventually the monolith vanishes. Right? I didn't yeah. stay long enough to see the monolith vanish, but I, I hear that uh, the monolith did eventually vanish, and that's why it's called the strangler pattern. Right? It's based around the idea of strangler vines, which are a kind of a parasite vine that uh, <laughs> that um, uh, grows around a tree, uh, and then eventually kills the tree. So that's kind of it's uh, it's an Australian dude, Sam Neumann. Also, he was a thought works. So I was a colleague of his there, his theirs, but after he coined the term. Um, and, uh, and so that's where it comes from. So th- that's, you know, that, so there's, a, there, so there's, oh, there's always ways forward, right? So the monolith is a great way to iterate fast, um, but then you get to a point where you're like, okay, but these teams have competing interests and they, and, and, and so now they're, the, the, you know, they're, they're pushing that competing interest into the core, making the core needlessly complicated, slowing down their ability to iterate, slowing down their ability to erase independently. And so we need to separate them. We need to give them their own you know their own rooms, right? And so the way you do that is you put a BFF between their app and your monolith, and eventually move the functionality that they're depending on out of the monolith into the into the into the BFF, and then mm-hmm. and then then you, and then you have microservices. So in a so let's say in a couple of years, um, if our team becomes that big and we need some sort of individual team autonomy. For any of these releases, how hard is it? Do you think we'll have to shift out of a monolith to a microservices? If so, like, is it very hard, or we can integrate that within our own monolithic architecture? I think it'd be very hard, given what we've, like, given that what we're doing right now, it wouldn't be very hard at all. It'd just be like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be, it would yeah. be very. It would just simply would use the same approach, right? We would think yeah. about, we would think about, okay. Let's pretend we already have microservices by making these BFFs that abstract the relationship between the thing consuming the services and the thing providing the services. 
Even, yeah. though, even though the thing providing the services is still the same old monolith from before, it looks like microservices because you can call it from different uh, APIs. And then you move the functionality into actual microservices th that the BFF abstracts. And then you can even eventually, like, like if you go all the way to the client end where, you're, where, you're, where your services are being called directly from the browser, although that's only possible in certain circumstances, then even the BFF could vanish, right? So even the strangler mm -hmm. vines themselves could, yeah. uh, could vanish eventually. Right. But I mean, this, uh, they like you know the 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 the, the, str the strangler pattern is something that. But I mean, like facade patterns and anti-corruption layers. I mean, like we've had similar kind of, we've had similar kind of, like the the idea of putting something in between two things to abstract the interface and then switching out the backend thing. You know, there's many examples of that in computer engineering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and we have been progressively and painfully moving from a monolith model that we started with. Uh, to you know, more agile and more uh, micro uh, situation. We already kind of have one in, in a certain extent. Like the teams consider their own releases and their own code, their own responsibility, and kind of coordinate themselves. So it's, I mean, I think Dimitri's been uh, very successful and very good at kind of slowly and progressively moving us in that direction. You know, because just mon the problem with monoliths is you're relying on three or four people always in those big monolith systems understanding the kernel or a very small number of people who understand the kernel and uh, and, and they're just going to be a blocker there's not you know any big monolithic system just yeah, yeah. gets so complicated eventually that's it that's it and a lot of that complexity is being is driven by the fact that there's many front-end systems that communicate back to it and because all yeah. those front-end systems have their own requirements sometimes competing then, uh, then it creates greater and greater complexity. Uh, it also creates semantic complexity, right? Because, like, 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 if you think about like a user model, I uh, you like, like the the, <clears throat> the the what a user is for one system may be very different from what a user is from a different system in terms of the kind of properties and relationships that uh, you know that uh, entity has. Um, and if you force it to be one user. Uh, object and that object becomes more and more and more complicated as, as more things get attached to it to serve different functions like a user from the point of view of the financial system a user from the point of view of the access control system a user point of view from like the sharing and analytic system are all different things right and uh, mm -hmm. and if you start to if you start to uh uh, try try to create one great user, then that great user is going to be super complicated. And yeah, you can have a like 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 um, uh, like Kevin said, you can have a shrinking number of people who fully understand what all the different like terms and codes and IDs and relationships are on the user object. And, and then and then eventually you have fear where there's all kinds of like properties of the user object and features of the user system that nobody even knows if anybody's using them anymore because there's so many. So they're just like left there. Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, they're the machine that goes bing in Monty Python, right? Like nobody knows what it does, but we need to keep it there in case the administrators come around. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and that's, uh, and that's, and, and, and that's what a lot of the functionality becomes. So it grows and grows and grows. And then eventually uh, all that growth leads to complexity, like security issues, performance issues, uh, and, and, and slows down your ability to test and, and deliver. Cool. Excellent. Well, thanks, Robin. That man was really good. Really oh, thanks, man. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> thanks, Robin. Thanks, Robin.